Hi and welcome to Contemporary Art Podcast with me, Lisa Farrell. It's a heat wave where I live. Um, that's why I'm gonna be a little bit low in energy, I guess, today. Hopefully not too much. I don't know if you know this, but I kind of hate summers. I hate heat waves. Um, anything above 22 Celsius is torture to me personally. Um, if you like summer, I hate you. <laughs> No, the thing is, I kind of noticed that a lot of people always say that they like summer and they always say that they like hot weather and they always complain when it's only like 25 degrees or whatever. But then when you really see them on the days when it is hot, they're also miserable. So it's like, why are you lying that you like this? Like, you definitely don't. I honestly, it's been four days of like 30 to 33 degrees. It doesn't cool off at night either. It cools off, I think the lowest was like 20. That's ridiculous to me. I I grew up in a place where even if it was really hot um, in the summer during the day, it would cool off when it was nighttime. Like it would fall down to like 10 degrees. Okay, maybe not 10, but like 13 or something like you know around that. I just find it weird. Okay, like to me, it's just uninhabitable and the thing is, I've been living in this city for, I don't know, seven years or something like that. So um, I want to tell you, when I moved here, the climate was very different. It was a, an anomaly to have this type of weather. Um, if that would happen, it would happen once in like two to three years and it would be a couple of days, you know. Now it's the norm. It just happens for weeks on end. And I understand that this is the climate change effects and stuff like that, but I'm just miserable in it. I genuinely am. It makes me feel sick, <laughs> like physically. And when I'm feeling physically sick, I immediately, like my mental health just goes, ooh, all the way down. Um, I've always, uh, the thing is, I've been kind of anxious about health and I had mental health issues before I even get, got cancer, you know? And now it's like a whole another story, you know? Like a whole other level. And I just, I just don't want to be dealing with this. I propose that we, um, at this point, I think we should just end all of those billionaires. I'm not joking. Like, this is not a joke. <laughs> I am suggesting a coup, you know? I'm suggesting a revolution, you know? I am sick and tired of this. This is not, this is not the mood. This is not the vibe. I cannot handle this. Today, we're gonna talk about data. This podcast might be a little bit shorter than usual just because, girly girls, I am not an not in a good shape i'm telling you um i've been unable to properly eat and then i would eat one meal at the end of the day when i actually start feeling like you know hungry because i don't feel hungry the entire day because it's so hot and then i overeat in that one meal and it makes me sick i'm just not having a good time and i still have like four or five days of this heat to go like there's four more days of the same weather. In any case, um, we're gonna talk about music first because I think that I wanna get it out of the way so we can start talking about that afterwards without me, you know, worrying that I have another section to go. Okay, so let's do the music. What? Are they insane? How are we supposed to survive without any tune? Without any tune? Um, I made a playlist. I'm gonna link it below. I think it's a pretty good summer playlist. R&B pop from early 2000s-esque kind of songs um, that are a little bit more chill rather than very like, you know, um, intense. Um, and a few songs on that playlist are from this group called Flo. There is F-L-O, this three girls that um, have kind of like R&B-ish music kind of like TLC vibes, you know? I think you should check them out. They're gonna be um, in the playlist and you can just, you know, look them up if you want to. I think you're gonna enjoy them, probably. <laughs> Maybe not, I don't know. But I do really like their music, so um, check them out. They have like really great vocal harmonies and it's catchy. It's not like a boring type of R&B because I, I really, really love R&B, but it can be so boring uh, because the themes are repetitive the vocal arrangements and the vocal gymnastics like sometimes they overdo it you know in in r b in general so yeah um flow great just so good if you know any music 
along the lines of like the playlist that I linked um, in the description, let me know because I would love to get on that um, if I haven't listened to some artists. Anyway, let's get into the data. Yeah, she's a full on Monet. It's like the painting, see? So far away, it's okay, but up close, it's a big old mess. So Dada is a very interesting thing. It's early 20th century, early-ish. A movement that if I were to describe in like one sentence, I would say that it's just like a bunch of people who were really sick of nationalistic type of views, materialism, class issues, um, a bunch of other political issues, you know? And people who were just like sick and tired of their government. It was especially, it, as far as I remember, it like originated in Switzerland. And um, it was a reactionary kind of movement that happened because of the First World War. And um, a lot of people being really, especially a lot of people who were of German descent, being very pissed off about the nationalism that led them to that place you know to to having to pay reparations and just in general having to deal with so much crap it was especially prevalent that view um in circles of uh, you know academics and people who had time to think about those things who were a little bit more on the artistic or philosophical side of things i really like data but i think that the way that it's introduced in um galleries usually in my experience it, it, of um, the shows that I have seen and um, the way that it is taught I think that it did not make an impact on me until I looked into it myself um, on accident like after I started learning about it on my own and I think that the reason why is because the way that it's introduced is usually in such a boring way to the point where it's like it's it's hard to get into even though it's so easy to get into when you actually learn about it yourself i at least i found it to be this people in terms of their views um at least um a general level because of obviously every single art movement even though it has some sort of guidelines um they're always kind of blurry there's some art movements that become a little bit more defined because of their opposition to other art movements or to politics sometimes art directions become a little bit clearer but most of the time they're kind of very like jumbled up and weird and um if you say that you like some art direction oftentimes um there's so much art so many famous artists that fall under that umbrella that you kind of inadvertently endorse those people i'm gonna tell you right away that there's probably some people that i if i look into them like within data movement that i would really really dislike their works and really dislike what they're about and whatever but in terms of um what it's supposed to be about and in terms of just general terms that's all we're going to be covering today because it's too much of a like you know it's a really big topic to just take on a whole art direction but let's just say that um we're talking about it generally i do like data and what data is all about not only did it come from um this mocking of nationalistic attitudes and belief systems um it also in its nature was focusing a lot on uh making art that is impossible or hard to monetize um, it was an art form that emphasized lack of exclusivity um, it was kind of the, the this art that spoke through um, unconventional mediums because the thing is just to set the scene right like this is let's say this is 1918 or something like that this is uh, where most that a work started to pop up it's like 1918 1920 all of that if you look at those works if you look at other works that were around at the time there's obviously the abstract abstract works were already a thing cubism was already a thing but this type of approach of taking ready-mades which a ready-made is like a it's an object um that wasn't altered in any way so like 
an artist basically find an object it could be like for example this highlighter right like i could find this highlighter and present it in a gallery in a way that makes it into an art object not just by being like this is an art object just because you know because like obviously you can do that do it. go ahead you know because there's a lot of people who always bring this up like oh i can just name it an artwork and it's just gonna be an artwork yeah sure like of course um but the artwork itself needs to either put artistic integrity or art and the the role of the artist into question or change the definition of art or question the definition of art it has defined it has a purpose basically so that's a re ready-made something that hasn't been altered or if it was altered it was very 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 minimal and um, oftentimes ready-made kind of talked about at the same time as uh, when people talk about appropriation and I don't mean cultural appropriation that's two different things um, appropriation in this case is art appropriation is when you can take something and then alter it in a big way or a small way and um, it becomes a new thing sometimes it can be someone else's images art um, sculpture it could be just ready-made just found objects that have been presented in a different way that kind of changes the context and changes the meaning of what the object is but basically this was the first one of the first times where we started to see this happen uh duchamp marcel duchamp i've, t I've talked about him in um, one of the first episodes of this podcast where we talked about what art is actually art um, so he's kind of considered to be the one of the main guys who were involved in this whole thing who inspired it or you know he started the whole ready-made thing and then he kind of basically started conceptual art or inspired conceptual art especially um, what we call conceptual today that is so anti-establishment anti-monetization to the point where they they are even you know they, they're so <laughs> anti everything like to the point where they're even anti themselves like they always there was this phrase that was um data um is anti-data and in many ways i think it makes sense because just the whole pretentiousness of having an art movement an art group an art direction that is talked by the contemporaries and not critics but the artists themselves there's something pretentious about it something weird and goofy about it so it makes sense that data um, people who were into data or were making art that would be considered data that they weren't into the idea of focusing too much on being data right so like it makes sense that they would be like data is not data or data is anti-data whatever it like it, it makes sense in my experience the way that i have been introduced to this movement even though i definitely agree with them like the whole shtick of like mocking and like mocking nationalism mocking establishment stuff like i fucking love that that's like that's my jam you know i love this but when i went to a gallery to a data exhibition that was my probably my first introduction to data i think that i haven't learned about it in um in school yet by that point and I remember that I went into into the gallery and I was so confused by what um, data is. First of all, to me personally, I think that the way that the exhibitions should be structured is that you have to give people some kind of hook, some type, some type of idea of what they're getting into from the get-go so they can kind of start putting pieces of the puzzle together based on like you know like why did you group these artworks together and whatever and obviously there are plaques that explain things and whatever i wish they were doing it in a more engaging way like just give me one sentence that's really big <laughs> so i can get an idea or my mind could switch in an you know in some kind of way switch on or get intrigued you know so i could 
be engaged in this with this works a little bit more because the thing with data is that a lot of the works that are usually exhibited and the works that get a lot of attention are those that were inspired by some mechanical drawings like that's what i saw when i first went to data exhibitions and a lot of them were very uh, monochrome and images that were in the collages because collages um weren't really a thing in fine art at that point so this was a very avant-garde idea to just cut up a bunch of shit and put it on a canvas or a piece of paper and call it art and especially obviously it, it had a meaning and it had a reason as to why everything was where it is on the page or on the canvas or whatever cutting things up and collaging them it, w it was never really um use that often yet it was already i think it was already appearing in cubism and stuff that was a very like radical idea it was quite um new and henna henna hosh it was very was kind of spearheading that whole cut up artwork style so when you walk into those galleries and you see those artworks they're so hard to understand because the the references in those images that they used don't speak to us anymore um let me explain that in a bit of a different way like i talked about this in um the video that i made in the podcast that i made about um bosch and his detailed painting um that was referenced in red velvet's feel the rhythm there's so much crap going on it's so detailed there's so many different images and to us they seem confusing and seem sometimes random sometimes they make us think were they high when were they when they made this what was the point of making this you know and if you start to break it down based on the vernacular that was available to people back then if you break it down based on what people were familiar with at the time all of a sudden you realize that this painting was actually extremely entertaining at the time it was it wasn't that hard to read as it is to us nowadays uh, because the symbolism the images that are used in it were more familiar to people and there was obviously contemporary conversation going on when they were looking at that work right so when you walk into the gallery of data works first of all um, you obviously get those artworks that are that look like um mechanical drawings and they those ones always bore the fuck out of me like it, it just bend it whichever way i still find it boring and um some of the artworks kind of give you a little bit more of an idea when you see for example a picture of this guy who read a poem in quotations which was just a bunch of sounds basically which is kind of like you know if someone was speaking simlish and they were just like saying gibberish but it was rhyming and there was emotion behind it and stuff like that um and th this guy was also dressed like a crab and kind of looked like a pope a little bit i will um <laughs> it's such a weird image to describe but uh basically there's a picture of him and it's not really an artwork the picture itself is not the artwork it was um his performance, him reading that poem, right? And the, the whole poem was about the fact that, um, not the translation, there was no translation, he was just saying gibberish, but um, the reason why he was saying gibberish is because um, he wanted to show kind of the reason as to why World War I happened, kind of, con kind of um, comparing it to, you remember when like in the Bible, people all got different types of languages because god was like don't build this thing too high to my kingdom oh my god bible is so s silly um and um and everyone kind of stopped understanding each other and that's how we got languages or whatever so um he was kind of referencing that and being like we're speaking different languages to each other but not like literally not linguistically as much as we just don't understand what we want from each other and why we want it when you see that picture it kind of gives you a little bit more of an idea of what you're looking at what kind of art direction you're looking at you look at a picture and you go what the hell is this why is he dressed like this right and it is rare to see a picture that is that old where someone is dressed like this it's not a picture that was taken yesterday if someone today would 
go outside and take a picture dressed like a crab mixed with a pope reading a poem in Sinlish, I wouldn't even bat an eye. But at the time, that was crazy, right? And obviously, when you see a picture of something like this in such grainy quality that reminds you of those old, old times and you see the date, it's like 1920 or something like that, you go, oh, interesting. So we're dealing with an art movement that has something more to offer than just sepia and black color pictures, you know? The reason why I'm even explaining data this way is because I just don't want you to think that it's boring. And every time, every iteration of explanation of data, and every time I went to the gallery or I saw works that were considered to be data, every time I was looking at them, it was something boring or it was presented in a boring way. So for example, let's talk about Hannah Hosh, right? A very important data artist. She has this work that's extremely famous. Um, it was made in 1919. As far as I remember, I have checked it a few days ago because I was just curious about the context. As far as I remember, um, in 1918 is when um, German women got the right to vote. So 1919 is basically just a year after that whole thing happened, right? And there's this um, cut up picture, basically a collage. And it's made out of a bunch of uh, magazine cutouts, um, newspaper cutouts. This work, when you look at it genuinely, um, first of all, because it is, again, it's um, it's not, it doesn't have that many colors, um, so your eyes kind of travel around the, the picture sporadically. And once again, this work was always introduced to me in the most boring way possible. Now, this is one of my favorite works, but when I got to see it for the first time and, and and the first times i was introduced to it it was always kind of just going over my head and the reason why is because um when you look at it the focus is the actual images that are there the people that are in those images the tongue-in-cheek kind of commentary that's going on um if we were to look at a work like this that was made by our contemporary right now, it would have a very different set of people in there and it would heavily depend on what nationality the person who is making it would be. Um, there are, for example, on the right, upper right of that collage, there's a lot of old establishment figures, a lot of people from like Germany's establishment that were kind of supporting a lot of the old views on the world. And at the bottom, um, you get kind of the opposite. There's a lot of um, juxtaposition, you know, of images going on. And um, a lot of people who are part of the establishment, part of the um, zeitgeist, part of the ruling class, and juxtaposing it with people who are radicals and artists and you know people who are spearheading the avant-garde there is marx and lenin in those images um and you get like map cutouts there's also like a reference to countries that already had laws changed to recognize women as citizens that can vote definitely about uh criticizing german culture and this picture is definitely like, it's literally just like cutting up the culture and rearranging it to kind of create a new meaning with those images. By the way, the work is called Cut with a Kitchen Knife Dada through the last Weimar beer belly cultural epoch of Germany. Weimar, um, it was, um, it's interesting because I, I believe that Weimar's um, time in Germany was until 1933, so I, I I wonder, I think that what, what she's saying here is basically we are making progress and we're going to make even more progress, right? By saying like they're going to cut through the beer belly of the German culture. Um, that's one of the reasons why I think that conversations about works like this that map out a narrative with contemporary to their time um, references 
it needs to be introduced by saying that this is a, this type of work um, that requires specific references. Some works just need that and I feel like if it's not mentioned you kind of start to look for meaning in the image itself without the context because um, you're hoping that the context is going to be provided somewhere or because there is no context you assume that this is type of work that doesn't need historical context to get what it is about because obviously all art is um, at least to a certain degree political um, however some works are just incomprehensible without the context you know i think that the context is usually extremely important to make you care about the work in general especially if it's not aesthetically your cup of tea you know this type of works always need this careful translation this historians and artists going back um and cross-referencing so many texts so many works to make sense of what the symbolism or or what the references are it's just not a good idea to introduce it in any other way you know um in any case um you know also another thing that was important for data was um this idea of um intervention um from the audience or intervention from chance or luck of uh, being part of the artwork again it wasn't really a thing before even though for example cubism was pushing um the boundaries of what art is or what representational art is data is the type of art that actually pushed the ideas of what the role of the artist in creation of the art actually is i think that before then there was a lot of uh, this mystique around the process of art making or a lot of this attitudes of only the elite being able to do this or only a certain class or only um being able or only being important to communication with that upper class I'm not saying that there's there's a lot of art movements that actually have that kind of theme like in terms of data uh, being uh, anti-establishment or anti-elitism um, but i think that this one is probably one of the first ones that was really questioning the artist's place in terms of creation of art where the artist's position wasn't a given in terms of it being so important as in being like the creator the owner the genius or the craftsman you know like there was something about the way that they approached it because they were the first ones who were like there's going to be chance that's going to intervene with my art with the performance or with the way that it, the art piece is produced um chance and other people might change what the artwork is and it wasn't like something they were trying to avoid there were a lot of artists who were doing this on purpose it was part of the artwork and not only the artwork but their system of beliefs and and what they were trying to do with their art you know so because of how data and people who were um working within or working with these ideas because of how much they were focusing on making it at least hard to monetize and push the boundaries of what an artwork is and how they would kind of you know sometimes even make it obsolete afterwards like for example with that crab pope guy i mean there's only a picture of it available that's not the artwork the artwork was his performance it doesn't there's no rec like um recording of it right there's no way to see it again be done in the same place by the same person they were focusing on making it something that is not about um getting into those institutions um and being revered as the artist um so sometimes i wonder if 
in our current culture, if um, internet culture and especially uh, memes are kind of um, very data, <laughs> it's not not in terms of you know. I think that sometimes when I say that, people misinterpret it and they're like, oh, because of the absurdist qualities of the works, which I mean. Mm, to an extent, because absurdism is part of data, um, you know, like the whole idea of just saying nonsense is already a bit absurd. Uh, but I, I'm such an, such a, <laughs> I don't even know what to call myself, a lover of the absurd, <laughs> that I would call anything absurd. If you, if I really want to, I could call everything um, absurd, and I would be correct in my opinion. Um, but because of all these qualities of um, the fleeting nature of it, the fact that whenever it is monetized, it loses its value and it starts to become kind of kitschy from the perspective of data, it reminds me of memes and how um, the most cutting edge stuff, because um, you know, if you just make a joke online, that's just a joke. Usually people call things memes when they are at the peak of their popularity and then they go into the whole you know valley of being hated and then people just forget about it but the funny thing about it to me is that it is just so goddamn difficult to monetize memes and to participate in it in a way that would create artificial value it is so anti-capitalist in so many ways in terms of um it just being lame. The whole thing is that um, memes are only cool for a, such a brief moment and in such um, specific context that when corporations, for example, try to recreate the effect or they try to um, make themselves more accessible or seem a bit more like just an average Joe, um, it doesn't quite work because the internet culture just resists monetization naturally so well. It's so weird. Making a t-shirt or a sweatshirt with a print of a meme is like the stupidest idea you can, you can ever do because um, today it's cool, tomorrow when or in the week when the shirt is done, this meme is not only annoying to everybody else, but it's probably going to be annoying to you too because of oversaturation, because of how fast the information is moving nowadays too. And it's just fascinating just how resistant it is to monetization, to exploitation, and to um, this use in a capitalistic kind of value-driven way. Not value, but more like artificial value-driven way, you know? It's just really interesting to me. Let me know if you think that data is kept alive in a more authentic way nowadays through internet culture <laughs> because I would love to chat about that if you have any opinions on it. Anyway, this one is a very short one, uh, just a bit of an introduction to data. We'll talk more about other works within the genre, <laughs> the art movement. Um, yeah, I'm wrapping this up because Mostly because I'm um, not feeling well and I need to turn on my conditioner and go to bed because it is 2 a.m. Anyway, I will talk to you soon. Let me know what you think, if you have any suggestions for the next theme in terms of, you know, if you want to hear about something. I already have a bunch of things planned, but ask questions because I will always answer them in the future. Anyway, thank you for listening or watching and listening. And bye!